Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Tuesday, August 10th. I have that date correct? 2010. And our special guest tonight is Charles Fidel on the neuroscience of learning. And Charles, this is your third time on the show, right? I think so, yes. Well, it's delightful to have you back. You're, you're good to keep coming back. Thank you. And this is a Thank topic you. I'm particularly interested in. Uh, the Future of Education is sponsored by Illuminate My Employer, and the project I work on is the Learn Central Social Network for Educators that is free. It has Illuminate baked in, and we hope you'll come and play around there. We have announced the Global Education Conference in November. Uh, this is a little bit of advance notice, but some of the uh, material is now up on the site, including the call for proposals. Um, if anybody here is interested in proposing to do a session for the conference, please go in there and give it a, a, do, a uh, do put your session in. It will give us a chance to kind of test the system and make sure it's working. The goal of this conference is to be inclusive. It's worldwide. It's five days, multiple languages, multiple tracks, and free. So we do hope that you will um, think about either presenting or attending. I've also started a site called Education Declarations, and we're not really talking much about it except for here, but it's at educationdeclarations.org, and it's a chance for you to, to say the things that you really care about in education, and the idea is to get a little bit of a grassroots movement around those truths that you find self-evident in education. Coming up on the future of education, uh, this Thursday, David Wood, who most people are not going to know, wrote a book called Get Paid for Who You Are. And as part of the Students 2.0 series, we're going to talk to him about the idea of, sort of micro entrepreneurship and, um, and how that would impact education. Uh, on the 17th, Kyle Ruddick, who is overseeing, directing the One Down Earth Project, will we'll talk to us about that and what teachers can do. On the 18th, Linda Darling Hammond from Stanford, and on the 19th, Carol Dweck from Stanford. So two great speakers um, through the end of that week. Uh, there's lots more coming up, so please, if you see something that you like, we hope you'll join us. If you've missed the show, the recordings are up at futureofeducation.com. Uh, Milton Chen last week on Education Nation. Uh, Marcel Rodriguez on Lifelike Pedagogy. Uh, both great interviews and um, very interesting, actually, to listen to in concert. If this is your first time in Illuminate, it is a participative environment. We want you to participate. At the bottom of the participant window, you'll see some emoticons that let you smile or clap. Uh, below that is your chat window, and it's awfully hard to see that chat once it gets going in such a small window. So if you'd like, go up to View Layouts, switch to the Wide Layout. That makes it a little bit easier to see the chat. And we're going to let you now indicate where you're listening from. So look to the left of the map, you'll see a laser pointer icon, a wand with a red star at the end. Click on that, and then click on the map to let us know where you're listening from. And you can shout it out in the chat as well. Leonard, nice to have you here. Peggy, you as well. In fact, it's nice to have all of you here. We are in sort of the dog days of summer, we know that our attendance is not what it might normally be. These are recorded, and this is a show I'm particularly glad we're doing now. So Charles, I'm going to turn it over to you. you. You've indicated you have more material than you think can fit in an hour, so we're going to let you be selective. But uh, please feel free to go ahead, and at any point in time you want to ask questions or get some audience participation, which I think you may have built in, call on me and I'll facilitate. Great. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, everyone, for braving the heat to be with us. Um, my melting point is 18 degrees Celsius, so for all of you who are suffering through uh, uh, two or three times that, uh, I, I have a lot of empathy. This is a very broad topic, and uh, let me start with something I just saw today in, uh, in Science News, showing you how fast the field is evolving. Today, this article, uh, Nature, 
quoting nature reviews neuroscience talking about music for all of you who love music and are musicians uh, music is more in increasingly linked to skills including language speech memory attention and even vocal emotion so the more we study neuroscience the more we realize the complexities and the, the uh, breadth of impact of what comes out of it so with that let me launch into my little presentation here with a quote by Roger Shank who's a cognitive scientist that says humans are not ideally set up to understand logic they're ideally set up to understand stories uh, meaning emotions are much deeper than uh, than logic and that's why we are wired a certain way and we have to keep that in mind when we teach so feel free to ask questions via the chat line at any time I'm going to spend most of uh, today talking about uh, this review of, of the neuroscience of learning and very quickly go over a paper that was uh, authored by uh, um, a, um, a consultancy named Materi on behalf of Cisco uh, to describe how do we apply what we know to the design of multimodal learning materials so quickly for the refresher you all remember and realize that neurons reshape their links constantly we, they create new ones, they reinforce existing ones, they weaken existing ones and they delete themselves they delete the connections so there's a, a, a lot, lot of plasticity in, the, in our brains and to make things even more complicated we have all sorts of neurotransmitters at play uh, that also link the cortex uh, decision making to um, the more the deeper brain which is portrayed here you see the three brain layers in, a, in as, as they've been described the neocortex which is the most recent addition to you know, through evolution uh, underneath we have the limbic system that relates a lot to emotions and at the most basic level uh, close to the stem we have the so-called reptilian brain which has the basic instincts and impulses and so on and so as you can see over evolution we've added uh, two major layers on top of that initial reptilian brain and it's the interplay between the three layers that make the complexity of where we are and what we do so if you all were to close your eyes for a moment and why not since I cannot see you uh, why won't we all do that and just realize as you focus on my voice that if it weren't for our senses our brains would be catastrophically entombed in in uh, in our skulls and it's a bit of a scary thought but that's really what it's about we are perceiving the reality of the world through our senses it sounds trivial but when you stop and think about it you realize how powerful that is and so these sensory um, triggers go either straight into our long-term memory or go through a working memory of sort that is where the processing takes place before storing and retrieving that takes place with the long-term memory that's of course extremely summarized now two very very important aspects here it is absolutely possible to have cognitive overloads the processing in our brain happens serially don't let anyone tell you that they can multitask that's not true they're not truly multitasking meaning they're not truly doing several tasks in parallel they're just single tasking back and forth very quickly so yes that in, its, in, its, in itself is a skill but they are not truly multitasking there are tasks that go on complete autopilot but that's a different story there are tasks that are completely um, automatic like you know our, our brains are beating and we're still talking or we are uh, driving a car and talking on a phone however our attention is on one or the other our attention is not on the driving and on the phone conversation that's why you see an, an increasing number of states that want to ban uh, cell phone conversations altogether now this is the second point is even more important 
the brain through evolution has tuned itself to conserve energy to the extent possible. The brain is about 5% of the body mass and it consumes 40 for zero, 40% 40 of the energy. So throughout evolution it's been extremely costly to have this big pile of gray goo function. And so the brain has devised all sorts of ways to minimize its energy and that has huge consequences to how we learn and how we act um, as, in the, as, uh, as human beings. This is profound. This propensity for shortcuts is the source of a lot of great things we do in learning and all the bad things we do in learning and cognitive processes in general. Once we have learned something, we will try very quickly to make an association with what we have learned and build on that learning. We will also try to take the shortcut to avoid having to think. So, very often, we end up, as we build experiences, with automatic responses to all sorts of things. The good news is that these automatic responses save us energy. The bad news is that they can trigger sometimes uncreative patterns and sometimes um, even to an extreme, if we take them to an extreme, bigoted patterns or whatever it is that we have inherited without paying attention to it. So, this is extremely important. It's at the basis of a lot of the psychological and cognitive biases that we have, that we all have, whether it's privileging a shorter term, um, a shorter term event over a, a, the probability of a longer term event. This happens constantly. That's why, for example, people will go and smoke because the instantaneous reward is much better than the much stronger than the long-term fear of a certain probability of disease. Okay. So um, to the question that Peggy is asking, how long should you keep your eyes closed? Well, I think if you've typed the question, it means your eyes were open unless you type far better than I do with your eyes closed. So. You're okay keeping them open. So I'm not going to go through uh, the details of this, only to point out that um, processing is somewhat complicated. It brings in uh, from the long-term memory our knowledge of concepts, facts, words, etc., events, and to make things even more sophisticated, long-term memory is really two has really two major aspects. One, which is so-called explicit, meaning uh, events, ideas, concepts, and so on, but more importantly, perhaps, implicit long-term memory related to skills and conditioning and reflexes and so on, which means really the following. You cannot fly a plane simply by learning the flight manual, which would be the explicit side of memory. You learn to fly a plane by doing the skill side, the procedural side which really joins the big debate that you're seeing in education circles nowadays where people are saying, you know, why should we be teaching skills and so on. And, and a lot of you who've um, been on these conferences know that uh, I'm a big proponent of skills-centered education. I authored a book on the topic with Bernie Trilling. And um, we, we really are saying, look, you learn a lot better the knowledge side if you learn it through applicability and experience of it through skills. So it's a not an either or conversation should be take place is how can we learn knowledge and skills simultaneously. So um, let's let's be reminded here that it's evolutionary pressure that provokes the intrinsic motivation that we have and I really mean intrinsic. There are really only two major bodily rewards we get, subsistence and reproduction. Really, it's, it's that basic. And of course, you can fake uh, the above two via drugs, but in the end, it's all about subsistence and reproduction. It drives a lot of behaviors. And so the social rewards that are built into our system are related to helping uh, subsistence and reproduction. So pleasant touch, attractive faces, etc you know, social status, all of these things are meant to maximize our survival. So, in addition to that, the motivational cycle 
um, is uh, is built in. So when we do have a function uh, affecting us, we do um, uh, recognize that emotion and make a decision about seeking it and continuing it or avoiding it and discontinuing. That's uh, uh, an obvious cycle that we all do without even thinking about it, but it's important to be reminded that it actually exists. Now the bad news is that there is no such thing as intrinsic motivation to learn academic materials. The layer of abstraction is way too far from these basic subsistence and survival things. There is no evidence of learning transfer. And so as we learn one topic, we don't necessarily see immediate transference to uh, another topic, even if it is adjacent. The controversy about multiple intelligence has not died out. Um, Gardner himself will admit that uh, he does not have scientific evidence of what he's proposing. And perhaps very um, concerning for people who show up in course of law, memory is unstable, it's reconstructed. So when you have witnesses coming in and swearing that they've seen this and that happen, they're actually reconstructing the event. It's not a perfect rendition. And as you know, for those of you who've watched uh, uh, television shows that try to portray this sort of thing, there is such a thing as memory drift that takes place. So, um, Steve, I think Laura has a question about turning off the music. So, Laura, I'm not sure why you're still hearing that. You shouldn't be. Uh, probably the best thing is to log out and log back in again if for some reason it is coming through Illuminate. But um, I, I'm not sure why that would be, but that would be a good solution. Okay, so now for the good news. Um, there are five major promoters of learning here. Um, we have so-called innate learning programs. So our brain has some areas that have specialized and some functions that have specialized uh, to make the processing faster, a bit like a subroutine in a software program. Uh, you may have read about mirror neurons that actually mimic um, the behaviors they see happen in others. So in a sense, it's empathy neurons, if you will. We have uh, fast processing of facial recognition. We can do basic counting innately. And we understand social status innately, except for uh, people who have um, low emotional quotient or autism and so on. They don't necessarily recognize these social cues. We also know that repetition of information matters. We also know that excitement matters because it's a, it's a positive arousal situation. We also know that uh, eating sugar is great when we are learning. And we also know that to consolidate learning, it's better to sleep. Now, what can we act on as educators? Oh, excuse me. First of all, repetition matters, as I said, and I'm repeating things here, but you have to repeat intelligently, meaning with enough novelty so it's not boring. We can act on, of course, the innate learning programs, on the repetition, as I was just saying, and we can act on excitement at the time of learning. The rest is out of our hands, whether it's the, the student sleeps enough or eats well enough, that's out of our hands. One of the best books, if not the very best book, on how people learn is Bransford et al. Uh, Brand, John Bransford has done this fabulous work with his team to summarize what was known uh, even as recently as a few years ago on how learning happens. And you see that it happens along those five C's to, uh, to uh, make it simpler as a mnemonic uh, tool. Context matters, so relevance matters. People are always asking why. We all were asking why when we were going to school and when we are learning something, we're always trying to say, why do I need to know this? Again, it's our brain being lazy and saying, why am I expending this energy? Please tell me again, uh, it better be useful to me. And so real world learning matters. Second, it also matters in terms of intrinsic motivation. Again, same question popping up. Why do I need to do this? Why do I care? Third, we construct our knowledge. 
it, we don't just absorb it magically, we construct it. And so the more we help that construction via model building, the better that is. Fourth, there are multiple facets of intelligence. So now you're thinking, well, Charles just told us that there's no proof about multiple intelligences. That's, and that's correct. I stand by that. There's no scientific evidence. However, we also do know that there are multiple facets to intelligence. It doesn't mis I'm not necessarily calling them separate intelligences. I'm saying there are various ways by which intelligence works. And the more we can en engage these ways, the stronger the confidence gets built. Lastly, and I have uh, interesting Ipsos data from Bechtel I could um, show you one of these days, uh, from students being polled in the UK just two years ago and being asked, how would you like to learn? How would you like to be taught? And you'd think that uh, they would say, oh, with technology, of course. Well, no. Technology comes as number four on the list. Number one and number three on the list are so related to social learning. The first aspect is learning in groups, and the second one is learning with friends. These are number one and number three on their list of how they want to be taught. Interestingly, number two on the list is they want to learn by doing practical things. Well, lo and behold, doing practical things, real-world learning is practical. And by doing, meaning a construction aspect to their learning. And so the students are just saying the obvious. They're saying they want to be taught by doing practical things, learning in groups with their friends. That's how they want to learn. And oh yeah, by the way, technology might help, but it's not the first thing that comes to their mind. You, we still have millions of years of evolution that have honed the social learning aspect to, uh, to our uh, um, our processes, and also with an aspect of its relevance. Again, why should the brain fatigue itself to and expend energy? We'd better know that it's going to be useful. All right. Um, out of all of this, we can really extract three critical principles that Bransford makes really clear in his uh, in his book. And Steve, regarding the Bechtel study, I have the whole thing. Uh, I'll be happy to send it to you if you want to redistribute it to uh, to everyone here on this uh, on this group. Or perhaps if I have a moment, I'll go dig it out later and show it to everyone on this uh, on this call. All right. So three critical principles um, as we teach a class or prepare material or whatever, we have to engage the preconceptions because from a very, very early age, uh, we have built preconceptions that need to be engaged so that learning uh, really ferrets out what the students already think and make sure that they're not already on the wrong pathway. Second, help that construction of the learning. It's not, again, not the old didactic uh, talking head sort of thing, which Unfortunately, in the confines of a short hour of presentation to a large audience that's distributed around the world is perhaps the most efficient mechanism, but it's not necessarily the most uh, appropriate mechanism for you to remember. It's the most efficient for me to distribute that information as broadly as possible. And lastly, uh, metacognitive strategies, meaning reflecting upon the learning. And this is something we never do enough of. Um, I'll be the first offender, and I know we're all, we are our offenders. We never take enough time to reflect on our actions, on what we've thought, on how we've learned, and, uh, and engage on, in a dialogue with whoever was around us at the time to see how we could do better next time. It doesn't have to take oodles of time. It would be great to have five to ten minutes at the end of every session to do so. And so, Steve, perhaps we can, if you keep an eye on the watch, we can perhaps uh, have a, a five to ten minutes at the end to, to reflect on how we've done here. And there are plenty of more refinements on the way that uh, the world is studying um, more parameters, such as interdependence of dualities and the feedback loops between them. So the mind, the mind and body connection that you all read about when, in one place or another, related to nutrition, exercise, muscle memory for those of you who are sports people or 
or uh, musicians, you know how important muscle memory is. We also have this duality between the cognitive and the emotional. So issues such as positive self-image, safety, nurturance of the environment all impact the quality of the learning. And then uh, this uh, progression uh, post-bloom, post-original bloom in a sense, where it's not only to, it's sufficient to talk about analytical and synthetic, but also link that to the creative aspect. Then another class of, um, of parameters that are being studied, timing uh, of, of optimal learning. So during childhood, when is the best time to learn multiple languages? It turns out that our ability to speak a language without an accent somewhat is pretty much disappeared by age 12. That's why you can hear remnants of a French accent in me. Um, had I learned English at a much earlier age, I probably would not have an accent or as strong as an accent. Uh, the importance of music, as I was saying earlier on this call, how important, important it is to, uh, to, to learn music at a young age because it helps all sorts of areas of the brain. Math anxiety is the sort of things that get propagated really very early on uh, to a child, very often unwittingly by, by parents and teachers alike, where the reflex is, oh my god, um, that's complicated, go ask your mom, or um, you know the more subtle messages that elementary school teachers give kids by shying away from mathematical topics. So kids pretty soon pick up on this math anxiety and simply repeat the patterns they've learned from others. During adolescence, um, sleep cycles uh, have shifted and yet we force those poor teenagers to start a class at 7 a.m. That's criminal even for adults, at least for me. And so we should be adjusting upward rather than downward when they show up at school. And of course, there's the, the toggling of their brains between being adult at one point and being a child at, uh, at you know ten, ten minutes later. Then throughout adulthood, um, issues related to lifelong learning, the fact that we're constantly doing so, uh, the healthcare benefits of um, of uh, I'm sorry, the the benefits of good healthcare when uh, when we are adults, uh, the need to continue oxygenating our brains through exercise and so on. Then there are also gender and cultural differences. And of course, it's a, a very risky topic to discuss because you get immediately accused of, uh, uh, well, at best political incorrectness and at worst uh, hor horrible biases and so on. But these are just realities of um, evolution, and uh, it doesn't necessarily imply that uh, uh, on that every single individual is beholden to a certain set of rules. But we do have um, statistical effects that affect populations of a certain gender, and we do have statistical effects that show up in various cultures and they're a fact of life and um, uh, you know not looking at them in the name of political correctness is uh, putting our heads in the sand. So on the even more exciting side what are the two main topics which in my opinion are going to be uh, enormously helpful in neuroscience in the coming uh, couple of decades is a how do we build expertise the better understanding of how expertise is built uh, from a pathway standpoint. And second, um, and really perhaps the superset of that, is how do we um, accelerate the learning process? We know it's linked to emotion. We know that it only took one time of us putting our fingers in this power socket to learn that it was uh, not a wise idea, that's assuming we survived it but it created a very strong emotion. Now, how can we use emotion to accelerate learning so things become much more sticky without using so much of it that we exhaust the student and we have this arms race having to constantly come up with a stronger and stronger emotion to make that learning stick because, as you know, our brains habituate to, us, to whatever level they're at. And so we, we sense differences. We don't sense steady states. 
so how do we uh, teach accelerate how do we accelerate learning without necessarily exhausting ourselves and getting into situations of habituation Okay, note that a number of these concepts were understood intuitively and, and philosophically, I guess, by a number of people. And I'm showing here three uh, philosophers, Confucius, Aristotle, and Michel de Montaigne, saying things such as, I do and I understand. So Confucius already understood the importance of con constructivism. Aristotle in his own way understood also how it was important to be able to teach to prove that you knew something so again it's a form of constructivism and Michel de Montaigne uh, and so did Benjamin Franklin by the way are arguing for a mind well trained rather than simply filled so uh, I'm um, just looking uh, quickly at uh, the chat line. Leonard, a uh, good question about uh, do we need more acceleration? Please bring it up in a moment when we have the Q&A uh, starting. This is a, an interesting uh, question you're, uh, you're asking. Um, we are really... I just want to remind everyone that uh, since the, the, the cave, we haven't really found other entertainment experiences besides the major three here, gaming, be it cerebral or physical, music, and storytelling in all its forms, uh, cinema storytelling, uh, campfires with ghoulish stories or storytelling, etc., etc. So, I'm going to stop here. Um, uh, this is the midpoint, and uh, perhaps uh, take a few questions. Do you want to start with Leonard's? Certainly. So, Leonard, uh, you're saying, do we need more acceleration? We have fast food. We do we really need fast learning? Um, here's here's my take. I, I'll be, of course, the last one to defend fast food, and I'll be certainly the last one to defend the acceleration we see in the society, where everything has to be done yesterday, if not uh, the day before. Never mind the instantaneous anymore. Nevertheless, um, there are some aspects of learning that could benefit from um, a certain intensity and speed of learning. Um, and, you know, it's like everything, particularly because of its emotional uh, intensity, it would have to be used wisely. Uh, one of my biggest beefs with, with uh, how learning takes place is that because learning is experiential, um, it requires um, it requires uh, the, the learner to have gone through the same situation in one way or another. And because we don't do that very easily, we forget the lessons of history, for instance. For instance. So let me give you an example. Um, the Holocaust, um, terrifying thing, happened before with the Armenians at the beginning of the century, never really uh, surfaced much until the end of the century resurfaced during World War II with, uh, with Hitler and uh, the concentration camps um, and then after that still continued happening in places like Rwanda and uh, former Yugoslavia and so on. These are situations where you would love to see some accelerated learning take place to r remind people very very actively of the consequences of this sort of behavior. So long-winded answer I, I apologize but I think there are, there are plenty of situations where I could see an application of accelerated learning um, let's see other questions uh, Steve given that you you're uh, watching the the stream here uh, would you like to to uh, point something to sure me? Bruce just asked uh, are associations among concepts in a concept map like connections among neurons but just at another scale The, we we all learn by association. Um, that's how we construct memories. They're they're built uh, layer by layer by layer by associating with all sorts of things. And if you study people who are uh, who have synesthesia, meaning they have enormous memory recalls, they do that through association of all sorts of sensory 
visualizations like colors and tastes and smells and so on with um, existing, uh, existing memories on which they build stories. So um, you could you could you could make this analogy at the mic at the microscopic level with the macroscopic level. Um, it's unclear whether it functions exactly the same way, but certainly uh, neurons work through connectivity, and these associations work through connect connectivity as well. But it's a different uh, class and type of connectivity. So last week we heard from Marcelo Rodriguez, who runs a school in Brazil, uh, where they practice what they call lifelike pedagogy, and the class is together um, uh, organized projects that they complete within the frame of two months. So Scott's asking, to what degree can we optimize learning through whole class activities compared to individual learning plans? So you're, uh, uh, I think you're referring to the Lumiar schools in Brazil? No, it's actually called the Scola do Max, but I, there could be another school doing something similar. Okay. All right. Well, um, my take on 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 uh, on it is like it's it's a, like everything. It's a question of balance, and so it, there's an optimal point being the didactic aspect and a constructivist aspect. Not everything in a curriculum deserves the amount of attention and cognitive processing um, as other topics. So the example I like to give, and I have a, a paper that in the Massachusetts ASCD journal that shows, for example, takes, a, takes a Greek history as an example. Um, within Greek history, there are moments chronologically that have far less importance, far less, let's say, cognitive density than others. So Athens democracy compared to Sparta and philosophers and scientists had far more importance, significance, and impact and relevance in today's world than other aspects of Greek history, like the Bronze Age or the Persian Wars, or even to a certain extent Alexander the Great uh, into Ptolemaic Egypt. So, when when we devise a class or a lesson plan or a, or a whatever instruction cycle we really need to pay attention to what deserves the deep dives for which we will do projects, through which we'll teach skills, uh, that will require a lot of emotional and, and physical investment. From the ones that are more contextual, that are there to provide a link uh, between all the various um, aspects of what we're trying to teach. And for those, uh, a traditional didactic approach and even read at home situation would be perfectly enough. So I'm, I'm advocating a, um, a balance between the two approaches, not uh, necessarily wholesale one versus the other. Great. Um, there, there are a couple more comments, but I think if you wanted to move on, you could. All right. So we'll do that, and uh, we'll get back to, to uh, questions in, let's say, 10 minutes. So this, um, this section on multi-application of everything I've discussed to multimodal learning, uh, you can download a, a report uh, on the Cisco.com website that, uh, that's called Multimodal Learning Through Media, what the research says. And uh, um, you'll be able to read a lot more detail of what we're talking about here. But in short, you've seen some, of, some charts like these showing this beautiful progression uh, showing that if you only read, you retain 10% of information, and if you do, you retain 80% of information. Well, this, inf this, this has been invented from scratch by someone really entrepreneurial who probably had to convince their management to spend money. These numbers are completely bogus, completely invented. Even this beautiful looking references that says cognitive science here at the bottom is purely bogus. This data does not exist. Look at how beautiful the progression is. It's a bit too clean, wouldn't you say? Well, that's what uh, made me wonder um, and uh, prompted me to do the research via Materi and uh, to debunk all of this. And you also see this sort of representation uh, using the Ed Edgar Dale's cone of learning, again, showing this beautiful progression of 10% all the way up to 90%. Again, that's invented data. 
same thing, another representation here, invented. All what Edgar Dale said, and here's the original book and the original, I mean, the original drawing from the book, he only said it's merely a visual aid. It talks about increased layers of abstraction. It's not talking about retention. Okay? So it was completely co opted by the entire industry, I guess. And and some data had, was grafted on to to show beautiful progressions to justify what the industry was trying to do. So what's the reality? What are the actual percentages? Is multimodal learning more effective or under what conditions? And what's the impact of interactivity? Much tougher to ferret out than you would think. And so here, this is really a lot of dimensions on one slide, so um, this is difficult. Pay attention. If you're trying to teach basic skills, you see, and, and you are using interactivity and multimodal learning, you see a 9 percentage point increase over the average. If you're trying to teach higher order skills and you're using interactivity and multimodal learning, you see a 32 percent increase. That's huge. If you're using multimodal learning without interactivity, you actually see a better result for basic skills, which says if you're going to be teaching basic skills, such as whatever multiplication tables or things that are really basic, do not waste your energy, money, and so on, your resources on interactivity. Multimodal learning is sufficient. You don't, it does not have to be interactive. However, if you want to teach higher order skills, and I'll take the extreme example of a flight simulator or a, a car simulator, then you do see a higher order effect by teaching not just through uh, multimodal learning, but also by using interactivity. Okay? Now, what's the impact of collaboration? If you learn cooperatively a complex task, you would see an 8% gain thanks to this cooperation over learning solo. But you would see an actually much greater impact of 19 percentage points higher if that learning was guided, scaffolded in various ways. And so it just shows simply the importance of a good coach that has, in a sense, a bigger impact, relatively speaking, to cooperative learning. Interesting, huh? It, uh, it really shakes a lot, of the, um, a lot of the opinions we've had for a couple of decades here. So what we'll be exploring next is the type of interactivity whether it's physical versus virtual versus machine, do we see a difference uh, between these three types of interactivities and their impact? This is just for the sake of completeness. I'm not going to ask you to read this. So in conclusion here, uh, multimodal learning improves retention, but for best ROI, you have to use interactivity selectively and collaboration more liberally. All right. Um, so I'm just, oops, excuse me. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to stop here, Steve. Uh, the rest uh, is the post, post word, and we can always discuss it at some other time. OK, so we do have, uh, I think, a very pertinent question. Elizabeth Holmes asked, uh, the information you're presenting has been documented for about a decade, published in How People Learn. Can you offer insight on why the education profession is not adopting a more research-based curriculum methodology? <laughs> yeah, uh, I've always wondered about that too. Well, I think for one, that uh, knowledge doesn't propagate in a society f very fast, uh, perhaps back to the accelerated learning aspects that I was uh, asking for. Um, and second, even when we know something um, let's say intellectually, it doesn't necessarily mean that we alter our behaviors. 
third, even if we are willing to alter our behaviors, do we have all the materials and all the infrastructure alongside that to allow us to do so? Are the assessments changed because of that? Um, I would venture to say certainly not uh, in most states and most countries. Uh, we're still measuring for knowledge, not for skills and knowledge. Um, has has the professional development changed in any significant way? Well, we teach some of these things in college, but do we really, really teach the fine grain application in the classroom? I don't know, perhaps not everywhere. Then we have a generational gap. Even if it is taught now in colleges, it takes a while until today's generation finally gets into uh, the command seats, right? And uh, as I was saying earlier, even when they do, the rest of the infrastructure around them isn't geared to do that. The books, uh, the tests, um, all of that is still very immovable and, and moves very, very slowly. Lastly, these things are moving relatively fast um, and there's probably a bit of a deluge of data. Not all of it so well understood, not all of it scientifically proven. And so um, because this is an industry with, where we'd rather do no harm, perhaps justifiably, a bit like in healthcare, we tend to wait until the data um, congeals a bit before we start acting on it. So these are all the reasons, at least that I can see, for which we haven't uh, fully jumped into all this. But you know, the simple fact that all of you are here shows the, the amount of interest we have on this sort of topic. And um, as, as there's more and more discussions and dialogue between the psychologists and neuroscientists on one hand and the educators on the other hand, I, I think we're going to get a lot more richness in the next couple of decades. If I was um, to do a PhD at this, uh, at this uh, time in my life, um, never mind the opportunity cost, this is exactly the, the subject I would be taking uh, on. It would be this area and nothing else in education. So this is intriguing to me because we kind of came to the same point with Milton Chen uh, last week on Education Nation. And in, he quoted, uh, early on, he quoted Dewey. And, and you sort of indicated that uh, you know, some of these themes, although we're, we're uncovering the research, they have been themes for a long time. So uh, it feels a little bit like there has to be a, a bigger explanation for why we resist change. Uh, and, and Leonard, I think, maybe uh, uh, tries to get at when he says, um, out of here, every organization has its own scripts that develop as a result of very deep functionality in their context. They learn through the strains and breakdowns of these scripts, not through information. Uh, in this, they are just like people. So is part of the dilemma that we have this expectation that, that we have a single educational system and that that change has to come centrally? Um, well, I would not call the U.S. a single education system by any stretch. Uh, if anything, it's a, it's, a, it's a myriad of education systems all um, are intertwined. I do not view the U.S. as a single education system at all. With 15,000 school districts and most of the decisions in the hands of uh, not just individual districts but individual teachers, I think this is one of the, the most decentralized systems in the world. I would say this is probably one of its uh, strengths and weaknesses at the same time. Uh, it allows for an enormous amount of experimentation, but it makes scaling of any successful experimentation extremely difficult. So that's really interesting and a very good point. And so my, my, the tension for me would be that we have this perception, though, that educational policy is driven nationally, but the reality is that it's very local. Is that somehow part of the, the dilemma of in, inaction, that, um, that even though there's local control, it doesn't feel like experimentation can take place? Um, well, uh, experimentation does take place. Uh, this is one of the most vibrant laboratories for, for education in the world, uh, not because of its size only, but because of its freedom to, to try things. So it's just uh, that we try all sorts of things, good, bad, and indifferent, and there's no process through which we sift through and we scale the successful things. If you look at what the feds have tried to do in the recent I3 grants and so on, is to focus on that scaling because we've we've had all sorts of great ideas for the past 30, 40 years. 
simply not scaled them. Fascinating. Okay, if you'd like to ask a question using the microphone, please feel free to use the hand with the green up arrow at the bottom of the participant window to raise your hand and we'll give you the mic. Uh, the, the chat has gotten faster, and so I'm not sure if I missed anything. Um, Doug had asked earlier, Doug Henry, did these principles apply to all age groups? And I think he was talking about uh, the uh, interactivity and the, um, and the um, multimodal learning. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, we, we, oh, there is such a thing as old dogs learning new tricks, absolutely. We, we all learn at any age. We are even generate new neurons at any age. It's simply that the rate at which we generate them slows down, like all other metabolic functions. So um, absolutely, this applies to any age. And one way of keeping yourself vibrant and, and stave off Alzheimer as much as possible is to do that. Learn new things, completely new things that uh, you haven't uh, done before. For example, uh, I've learned, I started learning two, two years ago how to drum. And I could hear the neurons creaking uh, with rust uh, in, in my brain because these were movements and, uh, and, and uh, way of reading partitions and so on that had never been exercised before. And so th that's the sort of thing that's absolutely necessary to create new connections and, and, new, uh, and refresh uh, your neuron base. So by all means, I would say the older you get, the more necessary that becomes rather than just optional, if it ever was optional. Scott, I've given you the microphone. Please go ahead. Thanks, Steve. Uh, great, great presentation. I'm wondering if there are specific schools that you can give as an example of where your ideas are being explored and implemented. Well, Scott. Uh, well, first, uh, let me uh, specify: these are not at all my ideas. This, this is just a synthesis of what I see out there. Um, and then people like Bransford and others have done a fabulous job in, in, in that. And uh, there's more coming every day. Kurt Fisher at Harvard, for example, is doing fabulous work as well. Um, regarding schools now, uh, look, schools are trying to do all of this. Um, a number of school systems documented in my book, like uh, let's, uh, say the Envision schools or the Coalition of the Central Schools and Catalina Foothills and New Tech High and High Tech High. And, you know, there's a, a number of um, charter slash alternative school systems that are using not necessarily the, the, the uh, basic neuroscience principles, but the derivative of that, meaning um, engaging preconceptions, uh, constructing the learning, uh, metacognitive activities, and so on. Um, the better schools that teach for skills, not just for knowledge, are naturally uh, going in the direction of using the derivative um, uh, functions of that basal base neuroscience. Scott, you're welcome to follow up, or uh, anyone else can feel free to raise their hand to grab the mic. Oh, just a, a brief comment. Um, thanks for your response. I apologize that I haven't read your, your book. Uh, I actually have ordered it, and it is in my office awaiting uh, for me to pick it up. Well, I, I thank you for the vote of confidence. Uh, of course, this uh, this whole thing about neuroscience is not at all part of the book. It's all the, the book is all about uh, skills centricity, but you can see how the two end up intersecting. So I'm intrigued by your uh, view of this, the uh, highly decentralized decision making process in American schools and the level of um, you didn't use the word innovation, but I might use it here. And I'm just not sure why that doesn't fully square with me. And, and Charles, either you or someone in the chat room, is there a reason that, uh, is there another piece to this puzzle that makes it hard for uh, adoption of new practices if, if we can agree that some of these principles, although newly explained, have, have existed in pockets for, for decades to centuries? Well, I mean, uh, you, ha you have uh, all sorts of factors at play. First of all, change is hard at the individual level as well as the societal level, right? Uh, in whatever granularity you take it, change is hard. Again, back to 
the quote unquote laziness of our brains, uh, minimizing the energy, why should we change if what we're doing is good enough? Right? So we have that profoundly built into our systems. Um, we don't relish change. Second, even when we do, then we get into debates about how to change and very often we can get reflexive behaviors about um, uh, you know, back to basics sorts of attitudes where when the going is good, we don't feel the need for change and when the going is bad, we say, oh my God, we're not going to take a huge risk now, look, we're in trouble, the financial system is, is imploding, uh, blah, 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 we're, we're competing with China and India, my God, we have to, to do something, therefore, conclusion, back to basics, we got to drill and kill a lot more the traditional subjects. Um, so. You know, uh, you, you wonder when can you make a change if during good times you can't and during bad times you can't either. But with that said, I do see now more than ever before a willingness by the population at large to say, look, we need to teach for skills, not just for knowledge. And by pretty much everywhere, the system that's creaking saying, we want to do that. And a lot of grassroots efforts going in that direction and yet at the same time we have some um, organi organizational efforts going on that are unfortunately a bit late and I mean by that common core in particular which is solving now the problem of the 80s and on, good, on the good side it's harmonizing what the, the standards in the US but on the bad side it's harmonizing them to what we should have been doing in the 80s not what we should be doing now So Leonard uh, said, um, mentioned the imposition of federal funding policy. So while it would it be fair to characterize the United States as not a big system, but being um, in some ways uh, largely driven by funding mechanisms towards conformity? There's no single mechanism. There's there's an intertwinement of I don't know 20 different. Uh, mechanism. One of the conversations I was having with a group this afternoon was can we actually do use a systems dynamics approach to analyze um, all of the feedback loops of these 20 or 25 different parameters that all are in play. So federal funding is one parameter. It uh, comes in and out depending on the administration, depending on the topic. Um, and obviously right now as we speak uh, Common Core is driven by the lure of federal funding. So the two have right now worked hand in hand, but it was not always the case. And this is just one point in time for one type of topics. Fascinating. Okay, we probably have time for one more question. If I've missed one in the chat, please uh, post it again or feel free to raise your hand. I do want to give thanks to Illuminate Learn Central for allowing me to run the interview series, and I'm going to post uh, the upcoming sessions. This is a good time to clap for Charles. Charles, thanks again for uh, delivering. That, that was fascinating, and I um, a number of people asked about saving the slides. Are you comfortable with them saving the slides from the show? Well, um, I'd, uh, there are a couple of uh, things I would like to, to change because I'm so tweaking this presentation uh, as you, you might have detected on a couple of slides. So I'd much rather send uh, everyone my tweaked version if they don't mind. Sure. So we'll put, we'll put a note up in the, um, when you have the tweaked version, we'll put a note up in the Future of Education uh, page uh, for that. Okay, so I think uh, we're, we're, this is a good time to close. Charles, thanks so much for coming on again. This is great material, and you've given us some good food for thought. Thanks to Illuminate. Thanks for you for attending. Uh, sure appreciate everyone coming out on a hot August night. Have a great night, everybody. And Steve, yes. I want to thank you for the opportunity, and thank everyone for attending. Terrific. And so if you did come late, I know some of you did, you're welcome to, I'll have, I should have the recording up tonight, both the full Illuminate recording and the uh, MP3. Thanks a bunch. Good night, everyone. Take care.